Dr. Vishad Vishwanathan from Trivandrum and Dr. Nina from Mumbai. We have some interesting talks lined up for this session. The first talk is from Lars Claresco, can we prevent RA and improve treatment for early RA? Followed by smoking theory of RA in South Asians by Dr. Uma Kumar, followed by a rapid question answer session. And lastly, talk by Dr. Rashmi on can we stop treatment in RA. I invite all the chairpersons and the speakers. Good evening, everybody. The last two decades have seen remarkable advances in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. And from what was considered a, a barely manageable disease, it has become an eminently controllable disease. And it is no more considered that much of a threat, especially if managed properly. So emboldened by the fact that we have been able to attain reasonable control in managing diseases, we are thinking about going deeper into the lupus, into, in, into, into rheumatoid, uh, trying to understand the pathogenesis. We are thinking about even uh, strategies to prevent and promote, um, uh, prevent uh, uh, rheumatoid and uh, catch it early. And uh, we are also talking about remission. So today we have eminent speakers uh, in this session. Uh, I invite. Uh, Um, I invite uh, Dr. Lars Klasberg uh, for uh, delivering the keynote lecture on can we, is it possible to prevent rheumatoid arthritis, sir, please. So, thank you a lot, and it's a great honor to be here again. And um, I've always loved being to India for both for the culture and for the energy that I see in your lectures and your science. So. Uh, the ultimate aim, of course, for any disease that we have is to prevent that disease to occur, and that is the most efficient, cha cheap, and most patient-friendly way of doing things, of course. But we are now approaching that situation in uh, RA to some extent. These are my enclosures. And this is the way that we have seen many times of a gradual increase of risk for developing seropositive RA where you have go from having a risk from genes and environment to having immunity without symptoms and having quite severe symptoms of pain and arthralgia and then finally getting the disease. And this is an illustration of in our, what we have seen in our country that actually before, up to one year before patients developed RA, they are severely affected they cannot go to work, and the curve shows sick leave that begins already 10 months before the onset of RA. It also shows that people with this uh, disease suffer from pain and from another uh, debilitating symptoms already before they develop the disease. So then this goes, in particular, with the autoantibodies. Now, you are all familiar with the anticitrine antibodies, but this picture shows that also other post-translation modifications are being seen by the antibodies present both before and at the mature stage of RA. So what we now know is that uh, ACPAs with different fine specificities precede development. And this is an old picture by my colleague Subitrantape in the north of Sweden, having a biobank of sera from patients who later on developed the disease. And what you can see here with these different curves is that autoantibodies with different fine specificities occur gradually, and more and more of them, the closer you come to development of the disease. This is just to show a multiplex assay that we use in order to look at these different types of, of antibodies. So, in order to understand what do these antibodies actually do, what are their effective functions in the context of both the symptoms that occur before disease and for development of the disease itself, we have used a technique for looking at monoclonal antibodies, taking single B cells or plasma cells, isolating them from these different tissues, from the gums, from the lungs, 
from bone marrow, and from joints, and from periphery, of course. And we have done that with this technology, isolating the B and the plasma cells, and then cloning the IGs, coding for the uh, various change of the uh, globulins, and expressing them. And this slide, with complicated shows, that oh, <laughs> shows that uh, on the y-axis you see a number of different uh, uh, peptides that are recognized by different monoclonal antibodies which are on the x-axis. And you see the different patterns and see that they're extremely different. And that's one of my main points of this, paper, of this lecture, that you, if, you, uh, if you analyze these antibodies in detail, you see that they are very different in the fine specificities and also, as we will see, in the functionalities. So, in other features, particularly developed by my colleagues in Leiden University Center in Holland, they've seen that one characteristic for these antibodies is that they have a rather peculiar type of glycosylation sugar in the FAB parts of the antibodies. Those antibodies, those glycosylation are quite specific for the uh, anticitrine antibodies, although not unique. The interesting thing is that these antibodies, both the very, against the various epitopes that I showed first, and with this fab glycosylation, emerge gradually during the phase before you actually get the disease. And they're very good as predictors of whether you will get the disease or not. And we'll come back to why that is important. Now, if these antibodies occur several years before onset of the disease. Thus, they cannot be generated in the joints. So where are they generated? And we know now that they are to the large extent generated in the lungs. And we are actually taking also B cells and plasma cells from the lung tissue and cloned and seeing that indeed these antibodies are produced in the lungs even before they have the onset of the disease. Also, they can be generated in the gums in patients with periodontitis. The same thing, we have taken small biopsies from these gums and cloned B cells and showing that we have aquas that can be produced by these cells. This is a very simple slide from a recently published paper in Arthritis Rheumatology, showing that these antibodies actually can induce exactly the type of symptoms that we have seen now in the individuals before they actually develop RA. So some of these monoclonal antibodies and also the polyclonal antibodies purified from a uh, patient's sera can induce pain by different mechanisms. So we know now quite specifically how pain is generated from these antibodies. We also know that they can cause bone loss and bone erosion to some extent. And they also can cause tenosynovitis coming very closely before onset of RA. The point is now that different monoclonal antibodies do these things. Some of them don't do it at all, some do it. So there's an interest in heterogeneity there. This is the new finding that is just uh, due to be published. And it's the surprising thing, when, you, when we made these different monoclonal antibodies, we saw that some of them indeed gives the symptoms preceding RA, but none of them alone give rise to arthritis. When we add a little bit of LPS or other type of second signals, then, can, then the, some of these monoclonals can actually develop and accelerate arthritis, but many of them completely inhibit the development of arthritis caused by another mechanism, the infusion of anticholidin antibodies. So this provided for us very recently, and these are still unpublished data, that the heterogeneity between these aquas is enormous with very different symptomatology with some of them, inhibition completely of their arthritis by others. And this sort of shows in a way this, and illustrates this idea that you have a situation with this autoimmunity where we are rather good in predicting who of those individuals develop arthritis 
we can get up to 70% even more of predictability, which is important for, for the clinical trials. But we also now know that this is a very dynamic situation. So this means that we have both accelerating antibodies and inhibiting antibodies. And the balance between them may be the one determining that some individuals will only have pain and bone loss, but not arthritis. Others will develop arthritis. So this is a very interesting situation for immunologists, because just pushing the buttons a little bit, if you know the system enough well, may refer to the system similar to the blue line here. So this provides some hope for what we could do. Now, this is, um, of course, the American way of looking at it. And um, uh, what we can say is that the strategy that we could develop, having understood a little bit more of this, this scenario, is that we could both make some prevention and having early treatment of RA in a better way than before. The obvious way of preventing is, of course, stopping smoking for those who do. The other way, which I will talk about more tomorrow when I have to talk about environment and climate change, is that we have also recently, with a paper which is um, um, very soon to be published, seen that a number of air pollutants, in particular in a genetically predisposed individuals, and particularly to go with smoking, can provide extremely high rates and risks for disease. And what you see in here is if you combine genetics and, for example, asbestos, in particular gasoline engine and also other diesel engines, and all these things that you see in the air in some cities in our continent, but also with you, with you of course, can then provide a 20 times increase to even more risk of getting the disease. So, that is also a subject, of course, for prevention in due time. Also, very interesting now is that if you have airway infections, this has been shown not for COVID, but for other coronaviruses, that is risk factors. And we are presently exploring to which extent long COVID can be part of the autoimmunity similar to uh, we see in RA. And interesting, uh, one of our students shown that repeated type of very heavy load can also be inducing the disease. So, finally, what can we do not only with lifestyle, but what we could do with therapies? And some of you have been to ACR, you have seen this very beautiful study from the airline group, George Schett and Gerard Kranke and colleagues, where they used Abatacept, Orencia, to treat individuals at high risk for disease, being exactly at the, at the point of development where you have the Red Cross there. And they treated with abatacept for six months. And this is what, what they saw. In the placebo group, 17 of patients developed arthritis. In the abatacept group, four. Major difference. After 18 months, 12 months without therapy, then still a significant uh, difference between the placebo and the Orencia group, showing that um, uh, the effect may stay, but you don't prevent completely, by no means. But it shows in principle that it's possible by interacting with the adaptive immune system that you could prevent disease. And a similar type of, of strategy has been used in Leiden. I got this slide from Tom Holsinger. They have used methotrexate and, and a bolus dose of cortisone. And what they saw was then in individuals with a high risk of getting disease, then you see in this kaplan meier curve that you delayed the onset of disease quite significantly by using this uh, strategy, but less so in those who had a less risk of disease. Now, in a, importantly, the pain which I showed initially that actually gave rise to work inability and a lot of symptoms was that pain was reduced very significantly from the use of, in this case, methotrexate and cortisone, showing that indeed this adaptive immune system and probably these antibodies that cause pain that you affect by this type of treatment. 
So this slide from the recent review is just showing that there are a number of different uh, immunotherapies that you could think of in the prevention area. Not exactly the ones because we don't think the TNF blockade, the R6 blockade would be that efficient, but other therapies with more specifically addressed immune system and depth immunity should be considered and many, uh, as many options uh, are there. To so finally, maybe my most important slide is what should you do? Uh, and this is the type of program that we are presently establishing in collaboration with three of our units in Europe, Erlangen, Leiden, and us. And we are sort of testing a system where we say that we should identify these individuals with pain and the risk for disease. We cannot do that in our clinical practices. We don't have time for that. Neither you nor us, and you of course not. But we could say web-based questionnaires which have questions which very precisely identify those who by symptoms have an increased risk. We have then an idea that we provide then a more advanced uh, serology chip to see which are the specific antibodies there. And I showed the difference between different monoclonals that promote the development of disease. And those who have these antibodies as well, they are given a small personal app where they could register their symptoms, and then get advice by lifestyle, and also get ways of monitoring their disease over time and monitoring therapies. And those who then are have these apps and get the very first signs of arthritis, then they could immediately via this app communicate with a care provider, and then get not within six months, which may be our delay time, but within a week have the very early signs of treatment for RA. And that is why I've incorporated in my, in my headline that establishing this type of system, which hopefully, if you do it digital and patient-driven, may not be that extremely um, impossible also when you have limited resources. And that is why I also see that if you have this type of system, then you could also have a better treatment for early RA, not only go into the somewhat futuristic aim of preventing the disease. So this is the way that we try to work. And I still think that prevention is the ultimate goal, and we should really go for it, even if it's not in our daily practice yet. But I'm sure that it will be. So with this, I thank you a lot for giving me the opportunity to be here again. And these are some of the collaborators who have uh, contributed to this work. So thank you. Thank you, sir, for that uh, wonderful lecture. Uh, let me in, uh, invite uh, Dr. Uma Kumar, madam, um, and she's speaking on the hot topic, smoking theory of rheumatoid arthritis in South Asians, whether it's a different story. Good evening, everyone. I'm sure you would be tired by now, and it's so difficult to tolerate the speaker towards the fag end of the day. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, the organizers, Dr. Devashish Tanda, Dr. Bedika, Dr. Saurav, and entire team for giving me this opportunity to be here. In the next 15 to minutes, I would be talking about, again, the slides are uh, moving at their own. OK. So after briefly introducing the subject uh, and talking about smoking and rheumatoid arthritis, I would be focusing on smoking theory any different in South Asian, that is other risk factors, and finally concluding my talk. As you all know, rheumatoid arthritis uh, has been the classical example of multifactorial disease, where genetic factors contribute only by 30 to 40% and uh, around 70% of the risk is by environmental factors. And also, uh, we have seen from the studies that uh, subclinical autoimmunity develops way before the development of the disease by many, many years. 
So this diagram shows you the mechanistic uh, classification or I would say stages in the development of rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, we all know that we have some amount of autoreactive cells lying dormant, but because of um, genetic and environmental factor interaction during childhood, they can uh, survive and proliferate, but it's not necessary that child develops rheumatoid arthritis. There could be need for uh, another hit, which can happen later, where again, uh, there comes the interaction of genetic and environmental factors which could be different from the first one and this phase is called preclinical RA where pathogenic autoantibodies they uh, undergo affinity maturation, epitope sharing and uh, their uh, number increase. Then subsequently patient develops uh, or transitions to uh, frank rheumatoid arthritis. It's important to remember these environmental factors may not be the same in each individual or at each stage of development of rheumatoid arthritis. They may vary. And it is important to know this because we are talking about preventing the development of rheumatoid arthritis or detecting the disease at the stage of preclinical RA where we can intervene and halt the progression of disease then and there. And uh, we all know there is synergistic effect of all these uh, risk factors and uh, there is a mucosal HIT-30 which is in vogue that uh, the antigens they enter through various pathways where there are certain changes in the peptide is going to uh, occur which will result uh, which is called citrullination resulting in uh, oxidative stress, inflammation, and ultimately the disease. And it has been seen in studies that in bowel fluid, anti-CCP antibody and rheumatoid factors were detected well before the development of disease in the joint. So that emphasizes that disease might start in the airways. So we'll be, I'll be focusing on environmental factors only during my talk. And as I said, that inflammation might initiate in the lung. And, and this has been actually put up beautifully by Dr. Carl, so I'll not go into the details of it. This is a very simplified way of telling you how rheumatoid arthritis develops following uh, inhalation of toxic products. As you can see, there is uh, Air, in air pollution, we have fine particles, ultra-fine particles to tell you PM 2.5 or even lesser size of particles that result in oxidative stress, which activates nuclear factor kappa B pathway, stimulating Th1 cells, inflammatory cytokines, inflammatory cytokines, and then uh, these monocytes which are lying dormant get activated, finally maturating the dendritic cell, pre antigen presentation, and then these self-reactive T lymphocytes, uh, they also get, uh, in, their numbers increase, they are, get activated, and af after that there is uh, inflammation and destruction of uh, the tissue where the inflammation is targeted. Even vitamin D deficiency is supposed to cause uh, rheumatoid arthritis, um, and in uh, air pollution, we talk about lower zone ozone also, which is when gets when the that increases, that results in uh, the process initiating the development of uh, autoantibodies, as happens in rheumatoid arthritis. And it has been seen in the study that there is a strong association between current smoking and the presence of citrullinated peptides in the lung in subjects without RA. Also, there had been increased presence of citrullinated peptides in bowel fluid, as I told you, in subjects without RA. Increased PAD2 and PAD4 expression has been seen in lung epithelial tissues, which emphasizes that indeed the origin of rheumatoid may be in the lungs. Then coming to impact of smoking as a risk factor for developing rheumatoid arthritis, there has been this paper, meta-analysis observational studies, which have clearly 
shown in patients who were ever smokers or those who had zero positive rheumatoid arthritis, current smokers and past smokers. That means smoking in any form is going is a significant risk factor for the development of rheumatoid arthritis. And rheumatoid arthritis develops particularly in, in males and those who smoke more than 20 pack per year. We all know smoking is one of the risk factors for development of interstitial lung disease in rheumatoid arthritis. We were talking about active smoking. Does passive smoking also influences the development of rheumatoid arthritis? Yes. In a population-based study, uh, it has uh, where only uh, non-smokers who have not smoked any time in the past had been taken. The study was, and Dr. Lars is one of the authors in this study. So uh, it was seen that no association was observed between exposure to passive smoking and RA risk. Here I would like to emphasize we have very controversial data in this domain. There are studies which have proven that smoke, smoking, uh, passive smoking is equally responsible for development of rheumatoid arthritis as you can see here, particularly in children. If there is exposure to smoke in childhood, or the same person grows and uh, becomes occasional smoker, in that group also there is increased in development of rheumatoid arthritis. So to say that exposure to passive smoking in childhood increases the risk of development of rheumatoid arthritis later in life. In another study, it was shown that passive smoking in childhood was positively associated with risk of RA. This study was carried out in 80,000 plus individuals and uh, passive smoking in adulthood was associated with an increased RA risk only in never smoking women. And age at RA onset was highest among women who have never ex been exposed to smoking. But it's not only the smoking which is responsible for development of RA. There are certain other environmental factors because we all know that uh, those who don't smoke also develop rheumatoid arthritis. So let's talk about pollution in both forms, indoor air pollution and outdoor air pollution. There had been many studies conducted uh, in uh, outdoor pollution domain, but there are only very few studies which are done in indoor air pollution domain. This is a data which uh, that, that has been taken from WHO study on global aging and adult health. And uh, the standardized questionnaires were instituted in lower uh, medium economic uh, countries, China, Ghana, India was part of it. Dr. Arvin Chopra has participated in the study. And as you can see, arthritis was only next to hypertension in the number of comorbidities. Then uh, women or, or people who were uh, exposed to coal, charcoal, wood, agriculture, crop, animal dung, shrub, grass, or, uh, and they were in comparison to electricity were more likely to develop uh, arthritis. So exposure to household air pollution is equally important, particularly what kind of cooking fuel is used in, uh, in, in these individual uh, houses. Then the same study when it was looked at male and females, there was increased risk of development of RA over the period of time. There was no difference. So exposure to household air pollution from cooking fuel is associated with an increased odds for arthritis. So basically it is all about biomass fuel exposure. You will be knowing we talk about stubble burning. Uh, and we had seen increased number of rheumatoid arthritis patients developing flare during that period. I'll come to that later. 
So biomass fluid actually refers to any recently living plant and or animal based material that is deliberately burned by humans as fuel including wood crop residue and animal dung. This particular study where COPD patients were recruited they were not having rheumatoid arthritis and, and this blood sample was analyzed for NTCCP and it was found that those who had COPD uh, secondary to smoking had more uh, chances of development of NTCCP antibody than in whom who had COPD not related to tobacco use. So, passive smoking is equally bad. Then coming to air pollution and rheumatoid arthritis flare, here again one sees that even you can see in this forest plot that these patients who were exposed to greater con concentrations of air pollutants, PM10 is more than 50, PM2.5 is more than 35 years, and there are more chances, they were at high risk of developing flare, CRP increase denotes flare in these patients with rheumatoid arthritis. And it has been proven in animal studies that diesel exhaust particles also uh, increase the development of arthritis in mice. So now coming to our work which we have done at AIMS. Uh, this is the paper where we looked at the preclinical autoimmunity in the normal adult population residing in a metro in Delhi. We screened 1,500 subjects and we were able to recruit only 500 uh, normal subjects who were residing in Delhi for more than 10 years. They were normal means all comorbidities and any disease state has been excluded. Those who had history of autoimmune disease in the family were also excluded and they were non-smokers. And um, we calculated the distance from the main road uh, to individual's house by using this Google map. And uh, this distance was used as a proxy to traffic pollution. And we found that 18% uh, of our population had presence of subclinical autoimmunity in presence of auto, in, uh, presence of autoantibodies. As I had mentioned, we did ANA, anti-CCP, rheumatoid factor, and also 67% six, the, of these patients had inflammatory markers elevated, and the age group was in the range of 20 and uh, 50. So you can imagine that they were having inflammation and subclinical autoimmunity, but they had no symptoms. And here you can see that um, uh, the distance, as the distance was less from the main road, then chances of them having inflammation and autoantibodies were more. Then in another study, what we did that we looked at oxidative stress and inflammation in healthy subjects. There again, we looked at the AQI, which is the air quality index. And all of you know that around the year in Delhi, uh, AQI is in the category of poor. So this is just, this shows the distribution of normal subjects in Delhi NCR area. We studied 350 subjects. And what we found that, here you can see, Oxidative, uh, these, they had 87% normal subjects had inflammatory markers positive, particularly IL-6, this, sorry, this is IL, interleukin-6, and total antioxidant levels were low in 65% of the patients, and oxidative stress was present in 76% of the normal healthy subjects. And we could find the correlation of, uh, uh, here you can see, we found correlation of OSI, which is oxidative stress index, uh, in, patient, in our subjects uh, with inflammatory markers. So 90, as I said, and we took OSI more than three as positive for oxidative stress. So to conclude, 
Environmental factors play synergistically with genetic factors in causing rheumatoid arthritis and smoking is a known risk factor for rheumatoid arthritis and flare. All of us know air pollution is contributing in a big way in the development of rheumatoid arthritis, not only rheumatoid arthritis but in the development of various autoimmune diseases. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for this wonderful talk. Uh, let's go over to the question-answer session now. If any question from the audience for our speakers? Yes. Thank you for a wonderful symposium. Earlier in the day today, uh, we heard some speakers mention about other risk factors for rheumatoid arthritis. Of course, we all know smoking, air pollution. You're not uh, audible, means. sir. Can you hear them? Uh, we can't hear the question, please. Am I audible now? Yes. Ashit Singhal from Chandigarh. Uh, thank you for a wonderful symposium on rheumatoid arthritis. Today, earlier in the day, we heard other speakers mention about other risk factors like high increased intake of coffee, salt as potential risk factors for rheumatoid arthritis. So has there been any work where they have shown uh, that tackling these risk factors, all the risk factors or the most of them could ameliorate the disease from occurring? We didn't get your last part of the question still. So uh, in the background of all these factors for rheumatoid arthritis, hmm. has there been any study where it has been shown by taking care of these risk factors that hmm. the disease was prevented or did not happen or it was a milder form of disease which actually happened? So are there any studies that if we take care of the risk factors, the arth rheumatoid arthritis does not happen? That is what you are asking? Yeah. I could say that uh, observation studies have been done, so relating to what you just heard about smoking, if you st stop smoke, it takes about 10 years before you actually reduce the risk, so that we know that if you s have been smoking and stop smoking, then the risk is reduced gradually over the years. That is the best example, but uh, having individuals at risk and then sort of making interventions Small studies have been done by Jeff Sparks and colleagues in the U.S. and they have uh, found that uh, some effects of diet uh, can happen because also diet is influencing with some omega-3 fatty acid rich, um, so, uh, rich, rich um, nutrients can reduce risk. Other studies, sm very small studies from the Netherlands have shown that those who are obese and are smoking, they have a large risk of getting disease if they have the antibodies, but still only comparative. So very few intervention studies have been done. A few are now ongoing using, for example, the type of digital tools that I uh, discussed, but very little known. So we have to rely on the observation studies so far. And if you could add. Actually, um, what studies have shown that it's not a single factor which is yeah. responsible for the development of rheumatoid arthritis. There are multiple factors working in synergy. Uh, so, uh, they are the factors which uh, you talked about and what Dr. Carl said, uh, besides that, there are certain unknown factors. So, saying that intervening at a particular point is going to hold the dis uh, development of the disease is very difficult to say, but there are studies, few studies which say that the onset of disease can be delayed as we get for, like in, we've seen that giving treatment early in the preclinical stage can just delay the development of the disease. So similarly, th that is available in the scientific domain. I had another question. Is there a, any hope of for a vaccine for prevention of rheumatoid arthritis in the future? Vaccine, is there any vaccine? Hope for vaccine. vaccine for, hope for vaccine. So, um, if the question is whether there are vaccines that could modify the immune response, 
several such efforts are going on in mice, but not yet reached human beings. Can we hope for such a vaccine in the future, actually, during our lifetimes? Hope for any vaccine in the future. Yeah, but <laughs> you could also say that the, we have been wondering whether vaccination with uh, pertussis or uh, rubella or the common type of vaccines, whether they provide risk factors for RA, and that we have investigated very closely in our setting, and we have not found any, in any indications that these common vaccines would in any way promote the risk of, the, of RA, which has been important for some of our patients who are afraid of vaccinations. I was hoping that we got better with making vaccines, especially after the COVID vaccine, so many types, so we could have some vaccine for some of the other diseases as well. We can take one last question. Uh, Ma'am, you told that uh, we know that incidence of smoking in our country is extremely low. And we know that females, uh, they smoke very less, rather it is insignificant. And there is a mismatch, whereas rheumatoid arthritis is a female preponderance disease, ratio of four is to one. How can you explain this mismatch and your theory of uh, lung being the, uh, the seat of uh, autoimmunity uh, this is very true that all autoimmune diseases for that matter are more common in women because of their certain factors that genetic predisposition their their uh, sexual hormones which are responsible for it uh, as you rightly pointed out that uh, smoking risk smoking uh, uh, habits are less prevalent in our country than comparison to other states uh, but it's not only smoking which is causing the disease. There are multiple other factors which are also responsible, starting from food to obesity to uh, uh, even, you know, uh, these various chemicals, pesticides, having recurrent infections. So everything coming together risks, increases the risk of development of rheumatoid arthritis. And it's happening more in... Uh, initially, that used to be in the developed uh, states, these non-communicable diseases, and we are now getting the epidemic of these non-communicables. So the next session is brainstorming, a big, <coughs> a big doubt. Can we stop treatment in RA? I request Dr. Rashmi Rungta. Um, at the outset, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak. Uh, so the topic of uh, my presentation is uh, slightly controversial. Uh, can we stop treatment in RA? So um, in the last few years, we have noticed a paradigm shift in the treatment strategy of RA with early initiation of therapy, treat to target approach, and uh, with optimal therapy, it is uh, estimated that almost 50 to 60 percent of the patients with RA can achieve remission. So there is much data on initiating, selecting and stepping up therapy, but there is hardly any data on tapering. So the last ACR guidelines conditionally recommend continuation of therapy over uh, dose reduction or tapering, and the recently published URAR guidelines actually uh, mentioned that we can uh, consider dose reduction if the patient is in remission for the last six months after already having stopped glucocorticoids. Uh, so, uh, with relation to this tapering, I would like to mention this uh, hypothesis by Paul Emery and Quinn. Uh, it's called the window of opportunity hypothesis, uh, which states that in early RA, uh, aggressive treatment can uh, reverse the underlying autoimmunity and in induce immune tolerance to an extent that uh, the patient can probably achieve uh, drug-free remission in the subsequent 5 to 10 years. So uh, why do we want to achieve drug-free remission or a DMARD-free remission? So the benefits are uh, for a patient it can mean return to normality, uh, reduction in costs, side effects, and better patient reported outcomes. And even the leader in early arthritis cohort has shown better uh, reduced mortality in those with, uh, with DFR. The uh, risks are uh, the, the presence of subclinical synovitis. So studies have so shown that patients in DAS-28 remission uh, still have uh, subclinical synovitis, which can lead to progression of joint damage and deformities. And the other obvious risk is of flare. So almost half of the patients flare after stopping DMARDs. Uh, most of them achieve remission um, 
after reinstitution of DMATS, but some may not. So, uh, what evidence do we have on DFR? So, there are a few um, studies, some clinical trials and a few observational studies, uh, most of which are of low quality. However, um, uh, I'll just uh, briefly discuss one systematic literature review. So, in this uh, table, the dark green uh, slide, the trials in the dark green uh, color are the ones which were of uh, good quality trials. So, I would like to draw your attention to this column over here. We can see that most of the studies have been done on early RA population and very few on established RA. And uh, in this uh, column, we can see that the treatment or the intervention given in all trials were different. Some of them have received monotherapy, some of the, them have received combinational uh, of DMARD, some of them have received uh, TNF inhibitors or uh, tocilizumab. So, the tapering criteria differed between different studies. Some used DAS-28, some used DAS-44. The definition of DMARD-free remission differed uh, in different studies. The length of follow-up also differed. And uh, one piece of information which we require, that is the rate of flares after stopping um, uh, DMARD therapy was only reported in a handful of trials. So, uh, with such heterogeneity in the inclusion criteria, uh, DFR criteria, it is very difficult to draw proper conclusions on uh, when should we start uh, tapering and when can we stop uh, uh, DMARD therapy. So, uh, the, uh, the same SLR shows that uh, around uh, DFR was achieved by uh, 5 to, uh, for three, DFR for 3 to 6 months was achieved by 5 to 24 per, uh, percent of the patients in those cohorts, but these last three cohorts uh, of 22 to 24 percent might be an overestimation because these trials allowed IM and oral corticosteroids, but they did not report uh, how much steroids the patient had received. So, uh, 24, uh, this 20 percent might be an overestimation. For sustained DFR, which is more than one year after stopping DMAS, that was achieved by around 11 to 20 percent of the patients. Flares during tapering uh, were uh, the commonest. Uh, early flares were there uh, by 10 to, uh, in 10 to 11 percent of the patients and as the duration of drug free remission increased, the uh, frequency of flares reduced. So, what are the predictors of remission? So, the clinical and radiographic variables are shorter disease duration, remission induction in the first three months, deep clinical remission that is a lower uh, DAS than 2.6 and uh, younger males with normal BMI non-smokers, TNFI have better remission uh, uh, prediction than uh, tocilizumab. Lower patient reported outcome measures, absence of imaging uh, evidence of synovitis and uh, ACPA positivity is the best studied predictor of relapse and uh, rheumatoid factor positivity reduces the chance of TNFI free remission. The, there's a multi uh, biomarker disease activity which has 12 variables including some cytokines and MMPs which could predict relapse in more than 80 percent of the patients in combination with ACPA. Also, uh, a shorter time to achieve remission is uh, predictive of uh, patient having sustained remission. So, if a patient achieves remission one month uh, earlier than another patient, his odds of having sustained remission goes up uh, are 1.11. And like the odds go up to 3.5 for a patient who has achieved remission one year earlier than another. And as the duration of drug-free remission increases, the risk of flare reduces. So, in the last point over here, that is from the BioRRA study, uh, which was recently published. So, in that, they have seen that these three transcripts, along with IL-27 and Boolean remission, can uh, predict uh, drug-free remission with an area under the curve of 0.96 and a sensitivity of 97 percent. So, coming back to the question with which we started, can we stop treatment in RA? So, uh, the answer is yes, but a lot of terms and conditions apply, which are uh, that we should utilize the window of opportunity by targeting by uh, uh, with a treat to target approach and try to attain early and deep remission within the first six months. The patient should not have major poor prognostic factors. We should educate the patient properly. The patient should stop smoking. The tapering should be attempted at least after six months of uh, being in complete remission. The tapering should be gradual. B DMART followed by CS DMART with methotrexate being the last DMART to be tapered. The patient should be under strict monitoring and needless to stay, uh, stay reinstation of treatment as at the first sign of flare. So, uh, my take home message would be instead of uh, having a, a step up therapy, should we, uh, like the patient should be uh, 
like un, instated on a treat to target therapy. So we should achieve remission as soon as the patient comes to us and then we can taper off the uh, drugs as, as, uh, as and when we can. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rashmi, for the wonderful talk. Now I request Dr. Vishad to give his words of wisdom in this matter. Yeah, the question that we have tried to address is, can we stop treatment of rheumatoid arthritis? So we know that uh, rheumatoid arthritis is a chronic progressive disease, and at present, etiology is unknown. So if you are asking about stopping treatment forever in rheumatoid arthritis, we are actually t talking about a cure for RA. So pathophysiologically, we know that it's an autoimmune disease, but there is no single identifiable cause. It is multifactorial, and multiple cytokine pathways are, have been implicated in the pathogenesis of rheumatoid. And what triggers is still not known, exactly not known. And if you are talking with so many question marks, I think we have only, we are seeing the elephant from different, probable elephant from different perspectives. The whole of elephant is still not uh, clearly visible. So if you are talking about a cure in rheumatoid arthritis at present, uh, realistically it's only a chance. And uh, as per the current knowledge, it's unlikely ca that we can do it uh, in all patients. We can, of course, use, uh, focus on the using minimum medications for the lowest possible time. There is a, a, a good data on successful tapering of methotrexate and even corticosteroids are available. What we can do best is attempt to rapid, uh, rapidly reduce the medicine and stopping, in, especially in low-risk patients, and uh, avoid unnecessary exposure to medications. Thank you. I would like to invite uh, Dr. Aman Sharma, sir, Professor of PGI Chandigarh, to begin the session of clinical pathological conference. Dr. Aman Sharma, sir, would be the facilitator for the CPC. I would also like to invite Dr. Anand Malviya, sir, head of the Department of Rheumatology at ISIC, New Delhi. Dr. Malviya, sir, will be the chief moderator for the CPC. We are already behind the schedule. So without uh, any further ado, I will request uh, my colleague and very close friend and a great room, uh, rheumatologist <laughs> student, okay. Ramnath Mishra, kindly go through the uh, CPC protocol uh, and then uh, give your discussion and then we, if time permits, we'll have question answers. Slide. Thank you, sir. I have captured the protocol through a set of slides. I, I go over you. You can match that with the protocol you have in hand. Uh, this 28 year old lady who was, uh, this was the last admission, 21-10-2020, and death, date of death was 29. There is a little printing mistake in the protocol, the date. One is 20 and another was 21. Aman, can I just make a correction? I, I think he, she could not have been admitted for a year. To start the story, 2014, uh, she was uh, uh, first detected to have ITP and treated with steroid. Then in two, May 2019 to July 2019, she was diagnosed to have abdominal TB because of fever, pain, pyoperitoneum, ascitic fluid AD of 81, PPD was negative, and she was treated with ATT. We are not sure how long she took ATT, but with it, she was also diagnosed as SLE, and she had a number of features which 
highly suggestive of SLE, that is malar rash, oral ulcers, photosensitivity, alopecia, myocarditis, ANA positive, and low complement C3 and C4. She was treated with methylprednisolone for three days and possibly oral steroid, but we don't know the dose or how long she took, and hydroxychloroquine. Again, <coughs> in the same year, 5th of August, she had a lupus flare with mucocutaneous hematological cirrhositis, nephritis, and myocarditis with considerably high DSDNA. In our center, the upper limit is 100. I believe 379 could be very high. Low C3, C4, and a 25 urine protein in the nephrotic range. She underwent a kidney biopsy, which was class 3 and 5, with activity index of 4 upon 24, with no chronicity index. And she was treated with IV cyclophosphamide, 6 dose, and the last dose was 13th, and then she was lost to follow up. She resurfaced in September 20 and was admitted till 5th October. And she had again facial and bilateral low limb edema for 25 days with heavy menstrual bleeding. And on evaluation, she had anemia, iron deficiency, chronic disease, thrombocytopenia, proteinuria rising up to now 12 grams and serum creatinine was normal. She again had low C3, C4. The direct Coombs test was negative and antiphospholipid antibodies were negative. This time she was treated with prednisolone and MMF one gram daily and proteinuria on 3rd October was three gram. So it was a steroid responsive proteinuria of course, had active SLE. The final admission was done 15 days later on 20th of October, and she lasted for nine days. This time, the presentation was shortness of breath, orthopnea, palpitation, decreased urinary output, swelling of the left lower limb. The general condition was fair. Pulse rate was high, she had BP and a respiratory rate of 30 per minute. The saturation of oxygen was 96 percent, she had oral candidiasis, anasarca and bilateral crepes. Both the heart sounds were normal and abdomen wise she had per abdomen a surgical scar present, soft, non-tender, no organomegaly bowel sounds are present. These uh, are the serial blood test result and uh, one can see at presentation the hemoglobin was 6.7 with a raised TLC count, a platelet of 74 and a creatinine of 3.46 with uh, potassium of 7.7. And as you can see through the serial results, almost daily, the hemoglobin hovered around that level. The TLC count increased to 20,000, then 17,000. The platelet count, again, uh, up till 23rd, there was a dip in the platelet count, and then terminally it was back to 90-100. She had very low albumin, 1.9, 1.8, 1.9, 1.7 1 on four consecutive days, and the creatine was <coughs> elevated almost throughout. Her procalcitonin was 6.5, that's very high, 
and remained high, and in 25th it was 100. The pro BNP marker of cardiac damage was very high, 30,367, 25,000, 26,000, uh, and the APTT was abnormal uh, towards the end. The fibrinogen was okay, but the D-dimer was high on 23rd and 25th till 25th. She was negative for APLA. The complements level is uh, normal, not no hypocomplementia. She was negative for blood culture and urine culture as it usually happens when we have septicemia, sepsis, but uh, the blood cultures or urine culture are usually negative. The hemoglobin A1c is 5.5. The thyroid function tests were normal. This is the blood gas serially and in fact there was a metabolic acidosis from the beginning with a base excess of minus 7.2 and she was given uh, NIV with FiO2 of 0.5 which increased to 0 0.9, 0 0.5, 0 0.6 and towards the end it was a FIO2 was 0.9. This information has been given and these are the chest x-ray. You see floppy shadowing mostly in the middle zone, lower zone and two days later uh, we see the dense shadows now and now she was intubated here and you can see subcutaneous emphysema which have been mentioned and this was the preterminal. I can't see the tube here but I believe from the day that it, this was one day later. Other investigation that we have provided that her echo on 24th and 26th, the ejection fraction came down to 25 to 30 percent. The ultrasound abdomen uh, had uh, moderate ascites, but the screen for DVT was negative. On the very first day of this last admission, she was hemodialized, dialyzed, and here she was positive for COVID-19, which was repeated on 25th, four days later, and it was negative. Non-invasive ventilation for respiratory failure. She was given <coughs> piprocillin, tazobactam, dexamethasone, and MP bolus. On 25th, 10, mechanical ventilation was given, MP was given. I must say that someone was bold to give rituximab. <coughs> but she had worsening respiratory failure, injection cholestine was added, profuse bleeding through ET tube, and she succumbed on 29th. So, it's very obvious she had SLE, she had nephritis, hematological feature, persistent thrombocytopenia, and myocarditis with COVID pneumonia and biventricular failure, and acute kidney injury in the last admission. And probably the most significant contribution death was the cardiac failure. Other pointers, there are biomarkers for cardiac failure. She had very high pro-BNP, thrombosis, and 
bacterial infection. So, a number of things. Let's uh, analyze. She definitely had a silly activity two weeks ago. The compliance was an issue with her, probably. There is no medicine she has been mentioned between the last discharge and this time. And uh, <coughs> her CTC for a normal leukocytosis, procal, CRP raised, all points to a bacterial infection. The chest x ray could be explained by SLE pneumonitis or diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. Uh, but diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, usually we see a more homogeneous pattern than this. So, my preferred diagnosis was present SLE and a bacterial infection. We always think of thrombosis even during the HIV period. So, there was the D dimer was high. There was the against was there was no evidence of DVT or ultrasound Doppler, no MI on ECG or ECO. TTP I don't consider. She didn't have any cystocytes which have been mentioned. So which infection? COVID for sure, <coughs> whether it was COVID alone and that COVID could have caused the myocarditis, but her procal was very high. So, I am tempted to think that it was a bacterial pneumonia, high procal with neutrophilic glycosytosis, but of course uh, will not explain a culture negative. Mycobacterium we always consider because she in the past she had TB and fluffy opacities on chest x-ray. They didn't look like uh, a TB <coughs> this time. It, I thought it was more bacterial. Always we are surprised in CPCs of fungal pneumonia. We think of something else and something else comes out. So I thought maybe the card they have in their pocket is that of a fungal infection. She had oral candidiasis in the past, but the high procal prevents me in making a logical fungal infection. The cause of cardiac failure is SLE myocarditis. COVID myocarditis is rare or a multi-inflammatory syndrome in adults have been described, but it usually occurs three to four weeks after COVID. We don't know when she picked up the COVID. I would stop here, sir. Okay, so if Can we have the last slide, please? So that we know what is Professor Mishra's diagnosis. Please do let the slide be on this screen. I will then request the treating physician, Professor Aman Sharma, to give his uh, story. What did he think of? I and think. Uh, what was the uh, treatment based upon? What hypothesis? Is what possibilities? So basically. Uh, this patient was initially admitted under us and then was shifted to the uh, the uh, COVID facility. The toss-up was uh, we had active lupus, we had COVID positivity. The only toss-up was whether and to what extent the manifestations are because of SLE and what are because of uh, COVID per se because as has been discussed uh, both uh, the lung involvement, the heart involvement and various other manifestations can occur in both. So that was uh, the the key. I think uh, that's what was done and has been managed, uh, has been uh, uh, reported in the, the protocol also. Uh, probably maybe we can have opinions from the, about diagnostic possibilities. One thing is that this is just a clinical diagnostic forum, so not management issues. So if probably I would... So, in short, 
uh, was it lupus and its complications? Was it more of COVID and related complications? Or a third possibility that we are missing somewhere? I will request, um, because the time is short, uh, precise questions or possibilities that our colleagues may like to mention, but in brief. That shows negative. Negative. Negative, negative that was mentioned. Yes, sir. CMV. Cytomegalovirus. Mr. Cytomegalovirus. Sir? Sit here, sit here. Usually I have pan cytomic, uh, pan picture. This lady was having a neutrophilic leukocytosis on day one, day two, day three. So therefore, I, I wouldn't consider CMV. I didn't consider CMV. Any other possibilities? Can you take the mic? I can't hear you. Bal was not done. The patient was in the COVID facility. So the bal that was there was not possible. Mike. You can come up while the question is. Sir, uh, actually I had a similar patient uh, like this, uh, was admitted around uh, three months ago uh, with my facility. And the patient had a similar presentation with a myocarditis patient. Your possibility, please. Uh, what, what is the possibility uh, in this Your case? diagnostic sir, uh, we, possibility. Uh, sir, uh, we found the nocardiosis in the biopsy in the intestine. Okay, so nocardiosis. Right. Yours? Sir, this patient had low globulin levels, so CVID was considered, which could have caused secondary infections also leading to this. Uh, so you think all the manifestation, even a priori for those many years were all because of an immunodeficiency? No, sir. SLE could have coexisted with CVID. Autoimmune okay. manifestations okay. are known to occur. Can we now request the pathologist to enlighten us and prove who is right and who is wrong? The verdict from the Supreme Court. Thank you, sir. There's no verdict. I'll just demonstrate what we saw and uh, just try to uh, dissect out like we try always try to dissect out in a multisystemic disease what could have been caused by what but uh, let's see how far we are able to do that. So in this young female, uh, can I have my slides please, a complete autopsy was done which means brain was also examined. Uh, the different uh, cavities were examined, there was some fluid in the uh, pericardial cavity which was 30 ml and hemorrhagic and in uh, peritoneal cavity also there was about 1 liter of fluid. So uh, uh, let's start with the kidneys. So as we see here uh, the kidneys were normal in size, they were slightly overweight the, on gross external examination they are normal, there are no focal lesions to say that there is no infarct. On cut section also we do not see any evidence of any focal lesions, there is uh, um, uh, the cortex is well maintained and there is a distinct corticomedullary junction. So at a low power what we can make out is that these round things which are glomeruli all of them seem to be involved which goes to say that it appears to be a class 4 lesion in a lupus, a case of lupus and when we try to look at what kind of uh, proliferations were there. You see endocapillary proliferation, we see extracapillary proliferation in the form of crescents which were present in more than 70 percent of the glomeruli and as well as what we see is these kind of uh, basement membranes which were quite thickened and which on these kind of uh, lesions which we call wire loops. There is some neutrophilic debris and there were some neutrophils which were also present there. So these are just some of the features which I am trying to uh, point out which were which are markers of active lesions. So there is wire loops, there are neutrophils, there is neutrophilic debris and crescents. Another picture to show that these wire loops were present in many of these glomeruli. So say, uh, uh, this is very peculiar of uh, lupus nephritis that you can have all kind of lesions in the same glomerulus. So you have wire loops, extracapillary proliferation and as well as endocapillary proliferation in the same glomerulus. These are the wire loops, but in addition if you see on a closer examination you see that this basement membrane is quite thickened 
like this without any subendothelial component thereby indicating a component of class 5 being also there. Some of the glomerulus shows mesangiolysis which is a uh, which is a manifestation of thrombotic microangiopathy. This uh, is a Masson's trichrome stain which highlights a degree of chronicity here. You can see there is interstitial fibrosis uh, which is in the form of this green color which is seen in the interstitium. Also some, some of the, uh, these crescents were old because there is a green color that means they were fibro or fibrocellular in nature. So, uh, this is just to show that they were both glomerular as well as interstitial scarring. So, this is of some duration. Blood vessels were examined, arteries are normal, there were no evidence of thrombosis or any arteritis in these uh, arteries which were examined and no immune deposits were seen on microscopy. Microscopic examination, we see a full house pattern with all the immunoglobulins being present. C3 and CV1Q being present and both the light chains being present. So, it is a full house pattern in a proliferative lesion which is class 4 lupus nephritis along with the component of membranous because you could see a granular staining pattern along the uh, capillary loops as well. On subtyping it was mainly IgG1 subtype which is seen. So, thereby further confirming that it is an immune mediated condition and you see this kind of a uh, granular deposits along the membrane to say that other than wire loops there was coexisting membranous. Though the arteries which I showed were normal, they had these deposition of immunoglobulins which means they were uncomplicated immune deposits within the blood vessels. So, this was uh, what we had as far as lupus nephritis was concerned and when we did the uh, activity scoring uh, keeping these parameters in mind, the total score comes out to be 12 and a chronicity score comes out to be 14. So, this is a class 4 plus 5 lupus nephritis with uncomplicated immune deposits in the vessels with the activity score of 12 and 4 as against the previous biopsy which we so mentioned during the protocol. As you see in this biopsy, there are only these some areas of proliferation being seen. So, that means at that point of time the proliferation were not class 4, rather they were only in less than 50 percent of the glomeruli only in the form of endocapillary proliferation, no crescents and no, ex, uh, no crescents and no wire loops. So, at that point of time the activity was only 2 and there was no chronicity. So, there was, a, um, uh, there was change in class, there was a lupus flare uh, in terms of kidney disease and the chronicity has progressed. Uh, so, this was a progression of activity and chronicity in this as far as kidneys are concerned. Now, coming to heart, the, as sir uh, mentioned there was pro BNP was quite high. As you see this heart weighed 330 grams which was normal for this age. On opening chambers we did not find any evidence of any endocarditis, mural or uh, along the valves, everything was normal. The blood vessels, the coronaries were dissected and they were also patent, there is no evidence of atherosclerosis. There was evidence of pericardial inflammation and fibrosis that means there is pericarditis as seen as fibroblast and within the myocardium you see there is separation of these my myocytes by this edematous edema as well as inflammatory cells being there. These are the blood vessels which I shall show you again. The myocytes are showing you evidence of degeneration as you see, if this is something normal. So, you see the evidence of degeneration in many of the myocytes along with accompanying edema which means an early change and some early inflammation which seems to be there. So, there is evidence of myocarditis. The blood vessels when we seen the endothelium is prominent, but there is no immune deposit seen grossly. Uh, on microscopic evaluation and there are no thrombi which are seen, there is no evidence of thrombotic microangiopathy. But on immunofluorescence, we do see presence of IgG and uh, IgG within these capillaries which were present within the myocardium uh, and some of the myocytes were non-specifically binding with this IgG. So, which means probably this myocarditis is due to immune mediated vascular component, immune mediated injury rather than being of viral origin. So, that is how we uh, concluded that this the, at least this myocarditis seems to be my lupus associated not because of COVID. The brain weight was normal, there was no grossly any abnormality which was seen. 
However, on microscopic ev evaluation, there was edema in the form of perineuronal edema and presence of some perivascular hemorrhages. Uh, within that, we did not find any uh, grossly abnormal blood vessels. There were no thrombotic microendopathy or vasculitis which was present. Uh, there were multiple such areas and on immunofluorescence, one could demonstrate presence of immune deposits here, thereby meaning that this uh, uh, brain uh, changes were because of lupus vasculopathy rather than uh, being due to thrombotic microangiopathy or any coagulation related um, issues which can happen in a COVID situation. So, again this was probably because of lupus vasculopathy as was probably in a, a, a paper on autopsy series of lupus was shown in one of the previous sessions. So, now coming to lung which again was one of the points of discussion. So, lungs as you see are were overweight, they weighed around 1 kg and on outer surface we can see that these are some blackish areas of discoloration and they were present on, on both the sides. On cut section you can make out that this is relatively normal area and largely the lungs are hemorrhagic in uh, color and there were some areas which are relatively different looking as compared to these hemorrhagic solid areas. They were uh, look at these areas which are rounded and they are purely uh, reddish, they were more softer than adjacent areas like this. The, these blood vessels were examined closely to look for any evidence of thrombosis which was not found in these. So, this is a scanner view of those uh, blackish localized areas and as you see these areas are just but not a pool of hemorrhage, there is nothing seems to be here and these areas seem to be relatively solid. In these areas as you see, you see the, there is widening of the septa and those hemorrhagic areas had more of just fresh blood. There is presence of edema within the alveolar spaces which is pale, so there is uh, alveolar edema. There were evidence of fibrin thrombi in other areas within the alveolar spaces. Type 2 pneumocytes were prominent and there were some of these capillaries which were having this kind of a fibrin thrombi which are getting organized and there was this kind of a expansion of alveolar, uh, alveolar lining and diffuse alveolar damage which was lining these, uh, these, PA, these membranes which were lining these alveolar spaces thereby meaning that there is evidence of diffuse alveolar damage which is a counterpart of ARDS. So, here we see fibrin balls and this is a hyaline membrane which lines these alveolar spaces which are almost completely obliterated. So, this was a cellular phase of uh, diffuse alveolar damage. The bronchi did not show any uh, cytomegalovirus or any other fungus. The only uh, this rich mucin was seen with some inflammation. So, in these solid areas of lungs what we had was diffuse, al diffuse alveolar damage in an exudative phase. Now, coming to the areas which were much more hemorrhagic like these ones. In these areas on a closer examination what we found was there was evidence of inflammation within the alveolar capillaries. There were neutrophilic debris here and some this pinkish material which is fibrin which means there was capillaritis, evidence of capillaritis in these particular areas which were resulting in shedding of this fresh RBCs into the lumen. Though bigger arteries did not show any evidence of uh, uh, thrombotic events. Here again you can see evidence of endotheliitis in one of the relatively bigger arteries. Immunofluorescence again was just to uh, kind of dissect out whether it is COVID related or immune mediated. So, here we see this is IgG stain and you see this is the alveolar septa. We see these capillaries and these capillaries do show presence of immunoglobulin deposition thereby indicating that possibly these uh, this kind of a capillaritis is being mediated by, it is immune mediated capillaritis and C4D was also positive which is again a marker of being classical complement pathway activation which is likely to happen in a case of lupus, uh, uh, lupus pathology. So, here what we had was diffuse alveolar hemorrhage with deposition of immunoglobulins and C4D uh, in areas of capillaritis thereby indicating a presence of lupus pneumonitis in a background which of diffuse alveolar damage which was probably COVID related. So, here uh, we did uh, submit tissue, various tissues for PCR for 
um, for SARS-CoV-2 virus and it was found to be positive. The patient was negative on serology uh, on uh, PCR testing on blood, but the tissues which were sampled, they did show positivity. Lung was positive. I shall show you some more. Immunohistochemistry for SARS-CoV-2 was also done and within these areas, lungs, the cytoplasmic positivity of this virus was demonstrated. So definitely some component of this lung pathology was due to a SARS-CoV-2 virus and in addition I have showed you immune mediated damage in some of the areas, in other areas, in hemorrhagic areas. Now coming to liver, pancreas and spleen, they were grossly normal. Liver did not show any abnormality, uh, there was no fibrosis. Spleen, however, showed depletion of white pulp, uh, there were a new blue, no blue cells here, so there was lymphodepletion as was confirmed on immunostain for CD3 and 20. And splenic tissue submitted also was positive for SARS-CoV-2 virus. Lymph nodes showed evidence of hemophagocytosis and lymphodepletion. These are the uh, uh, macrophages with RBCs engulfed. There was lymphodepletion as confirmed by these uh, stains and this lymph node however was negative for virus. The GI was grossly and microscopically normal and uh, the virus was tested here also which was negative, stomach is negative, skin did not show any changes and IF was negative so there was no lupus uh, band test. The uh, uterus and these were examined, there was adenomyosis and a splenic, there's a cyst on the outer aspect of this. Muscle, thyroid, adrenal, they all were normal. So summarizing our finding in this case, we have tried to dissect out the changes which were because of lupus and changes which were because of SARS-CoV virus. So uh, at autopsy, we uh, kind of uh, uh, confirmed that the lupus nephritis flare was there as there was increase in activity from class 3 to 4 along with class 5 being there. Lungs had evidence of lupus pneumonitis which was confirmed by immune uh, evidence of immune activation there. There was lupus myocarditis and pericarditis and brain changes because of lupus vasculopathy resulting in microhemorrhages. There was an element of diffuse alveolar damage in an exudative phase which was likely due to uh, SARS-CoV virus. There was hemophagocytosis again which could be virus induced. There was marked lymphodepletion. The patient has been treated quite a bit and maybe some component uh, could be because of this virus being there. Hemorrhagic cyst and organizing serocytis was there in the intestines and uh, uterus shows, showed adenomyosis. So this is what all we had in this case and for this I really thank my whole team, especially our residents of pathology who went and did the autopsy in COVID period where, where our facilities was not really that up to the mark for uh, to deal with the, this kind of an infective state. So however, uh, um, they went ahead and did the autopsy which was very good of them and our treating team which had put on a lot of efforts for getting the autopsy done. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nada. Uh, I think I will have to congratulate uh, Ramnath Mishra. He got the whole thing on the dot that this was primarily manifestation of systemic lupus with complications in several organs overlapping with SARS-2 uh, infection and some of the features in the autopsy clearly showing its presence and due to it the changes in the tissues. I will like in case you can make any other comments and your final. I thought you congratulated more than what I deserve because I, I was thinking that it was because of the race CRP pro-cal it was a complication of bacterial. I knew it was COVID, that was for sure. But uh, the COVID damage, all with activity, can explain the damage. My own, um, just one uh, comment is that shows clearly that our patients who disappear and resurface after some time, especially in lupus, they are in trouble. And in those cases, it's lupus mostly that is causing the main problem. Aman? Yeah, I think uh, there was a good clinical pathological correlation as we say. The pointers which were taking us away clinically from it being COVID were that uh, in the, the various cohorts including the NEGM publications and our own data from PGI, 
the anemia and hematological manifestations unless they end up with uh, um, you know HLH kind of presentation is not there in COVID per se but it was dominant in this patient as were the other manifestations which were highlighted so the dilemma always in a treating physician is which was being discussed just in the preceding session how much of the clinical presentation is because of infection in the presence of overwhelming evidence of disease activity I think we sometimes can tease out sometimes we can't and that enigma also continued in the discussion that we've had and I think uh, we've had a good clinical pathological correlation that's all that I would have to say I think I'll call it um, the session because we are sh uh, short of time and the next sessions are starting in the other halls Thank you, everyone.